We'll stay there in Luke chapter 12. It is a long chapter. I'm not obviously just kept grabbing a certain thought there. But the title of the sermon tonight is, well, it's there in verse 15. Look at Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12, verse 15. The Bible says, And he said unto them, Take heed and beware of covetousness. The title of the sermon tonight is Beware of Covetousness or Sins That Will Get You Kicked Out of Church, Part 2. <laughs> Sins That Will Get You Kicked Out of Church, Part 2. Beware of Covetousness. Now, just to uh, reinforce, just going back to 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11, you don't need to turn there. Let me just read it out to you again. I'll be reading out this passage every time you know, we do this series. But uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11, But now I have written unto you not to keep company if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous. So we've done fornication, now we're doing covetousness. Or an idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, with such an one know not to eat. For what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within. But them that are without, God judgeth. Therefore, put away from among yourselves that wicked person. Covetousness, being a covetous person, is being a wicked person. It is a sin that we're commanded in the Scriptures to kick people out of the church for. Now, you might say... and. If you're like me, you might be thinking, hold on, you know, amongst this list, yeah, I get a fornicator, I get an idolater, worshipping idols, I, I get a drunkard, I get all these things, but covetousness, I mean, is that really, I mean, don't we all kind of covet? Don't we all have that sin in our lives a little bit where we desire? I mean, what is covetousness? It's someone, or someone that's covetous, someone that has a strong desire for material possessions. Someone that has a strong desire for material possessions. And I'm sure if we think about it, we've all kind of looked at certain material possessions and go, oh man, I wish I had that, right? Well, I'm sure. So it, it kind of seems like a sin that's low on the scale of bad sins, right? I mean, you're just desiring it. It's not like you're doing anything. You're not, you're not, it's not like you're hurting anybody, surely. And yet God tells us, and even more so the reason to preach against it, is because it seems like a mild sin, and yet God says it is wickedness. God says a covetous person is wicked and ought to be kicked out of the church. That might seem severe and harsh, but that's the truth of God's word. Beware of covetousness. So covetous is someone with a strong desire for material possessions. Now we're going to pick it up from Luke chapter 12, verse 13. Luke chapter 12, verse 13. The Bible reads, And one of the company, so the Lord Jesus Christ was preaching... And someone in the group that was listening to him preach says this, said unto him, Master, speak to my brother that he divide the inheritance with me. So there was a dispute between two brothers over an inheritance, over some money that was passed down the family line. A dispute between the brothers. Now, we don't really know who was at fault. We don't know if it was the guy speaking to Jesus that was at fault. We don't know if it was the brother who was at fault. But something had gone wrong between these brothers and they were fighting over money. Okay? Now, it could have been the brother, one of the brothers, it could have been that he, you know, put things into, you know, deceived somehow and got all, got all the inheritance, you know, took more than his equal share of the inheritance and didn't, you know, allow his brethren to have a part of that inheritance. That's a possibility. I don't know. Or it could be that this guy, this guy could be like the prodigal son who took his inheritance, squandered it, spent it all, and has nothing left, and now he's, he wants some of that inheritance that his brother has because he's spent it all. We don't know. We don't know the reason between this dispute. We don't know who the, the, the wrong one was. We don't know really what's going on. But it's interesting how Jesus responds in the next verse, in verse 14. And he said unto him, Man, who made me a judge or a divider over you? Jesus says, I'm not the judge of you and your brother. That's interesting. I think that's a very interesting comment because, I mean, this is the Lord God. This is the creator of all things. And if anyone has the right to judge a matter like this, it's the Lord Jesus Christ. But what we find here in Christ is that even though Jesus Christ obviously is God, obviously Jesus knows who was defrauding the other in this case, he still has, you know... Um, he still has respect for proper authority and proper um, judgment when it comes to a family. You know, he, he could see there was a fight between these two brothers, but he realized that's not his business. You know, my business is to serve the Lord God. My business is to obey the Father, get souls saved, you know, um, have mercy on sinners, and be that sacrifice. You know, Jesus, I didn't come to deal with this dispute between two brethren. 
right? And, you know, that should tell us immediately, this is not about covetousness, but, you know, sometimes we feel the need to judge other Christians. We feel the need to judge other families. Oh, you know, that husband ought to be more like this. Or, you know, matters of, of raising your children. You know, we don't vaccinate our kids, right? But we don't go around telling other parents that you shouldn't vaccinate your kids, right? Or parents that decide to vaccinate their kids, they don't go around, I hope, you know, that go around saying, you shouldn't vaccinate your kids. Hey, that's not your call, right? There are certain um, institutions that God has established, whether that's the government, whether that's your workplace, whether that's your family, whether that's the church, where there are God-given heads of that institution, right? The head of this church is the Lord Jesus Christ, and I'm the under-shepherd. So when it comes to making judgment within a church and the church ministries, obviously that's my call. But I can't come into your house and tell you how to treat your wife, how to treat your husband, right? We're all ultimately accountable to the Lord. Now, I'm going to preach about husbands, I'm going to preach about wives, but then it's your call, heads of the home, husbands and fathers, to decide whether you're going to apply those principles, the things that you learnt, the things that you heard, the things that you read in the Bible, to your family. That's up to you. That's your call. I'm not there to judge your family. Okay, I've got my responsibilities on my own home, right? I've got to decide as well when I preach things, am I going to apply these things to my family, right? So we see that Jesus Christ, you know, respects the proper authority. I, I don't know what, what that, you know, maybe that was something that was, should have been, you know, asked between the parents of, the, of, of this brother, of these two brothers. I don't know. We don't have that much information. But I just think it's, it's interesting how, uh, uh, you know, Jesus knows his place, even though he's the God of the universe. You know, and he respects proper authority. He respects that proper breakdown in an institution. So look at verse 15. And he said unto them, so more important than who's at fault, more important than that, what does he say to the guy here in verse 15? Take heed, listen, hear, hear what I've got to say, and beware of covetousness. Beware of covetousness. Why? For a man's life consists not, of, not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth, possesseth. Your life is more than your material wealth. Your life is more than your possessions. Your life is more than what house you have, what car you drive, or what clothes you wear. Your life is more important than that. Okay? God is not a respecter of persons. He doesn't look down and sees the rich man and the poor man and thinks that the rich man is better than the poor man. He, God, look, we're all sinners in his sight. We've all come short of the glory of God and we all need salvation. We all need the Lord Jesus Christ. But the covetous man... Okay, the covetous man is someone that thinks his life is made up of what he possesses. He thinks there's value in what he has. He thinks there's value in his house, in his car, in his possessions, in his status, you know, amongst his, his fellow workers or his friends. That's what a covetous person looks for. They want to raise in their status, exult in what they have, in their material possessions. That's what makes a covetous person and Jesus Christ says, beware of covetousness, right? The, the inheritance, beware. Stop, you know, fighting over this. Take your fair share. Deal with, I mean, look, who's at fault? Beware of covetousness. Beware of be, being greedy of finances. Verse 16, and he spake a parable unto them, saying, so now he, he speaks a parable to illustrate this further, saying, the ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. Now, let me just stop there for a minute. Is there anything wrong if you're a rich man? I mean, if, if you just, maybe you got, inherit, you got inheritance, you're rich, or you worked hard and, you know, you invested well and, you know, things went your way, you're very productive and you got a lot of money. Is there anything wrong in that in of itself, that someone has a lot of wealth? No, it's not, right? There's nothing wrong with that. You know, we see God... Even in the Old Testament, blessing like Abraham and people like that with material wealth, with gold and silver and things like that, okay? There's nothing wrong. Every good gift cometh from the Father above, okay? There's nothing wrong with being rich. There's nothing wrong with being highly productive. None of these things are sinful in of themselves. But what does the rich man say to himself? This is the danger of becoming rich. And I think sometimes God prevents his believers, his people from becoming rich because the heart of man can turn very quickly. We see in verse 16, uh, sorry, uh, verse 17, it says, And he thought within himself. So the rich man thinks within himself, saying, What shall I do, because I have no room where to bestow my fruits? 
What an interesting thought to himself. I've got so much. He's not only rich, but he's got more than he needs. He's got plenty, right? What does he say? I don't know what to do with all this. <laughs> I don't know what to do with it. I mean, he's got so much, you know, possessions that he doesn't know. What now, look, would, if you had more than you needed and you, your barns were overflowing with, with things, would you say to yourself, I have no idea what to do with this? I mean, if you're a righteous man, if you're a righteous person, your first thought is, I wonder if there's any, any of my brethren that uh, have necessities that I can help them with. Maybe the Lord's given me so much so I can bless other people, right? Maybe I can give toward my church or maybe I can give toward certain missionaries or I can give you know, towards certain projects where the gospel's being sent out. I mean, that's what you'd be thinking, right? I mean, I hope so. I hope if you have way too much, you think, what do I do? You know, you think, hey, how can I bless other people? How can I make sure the Lord's work is being financed and that we're giving toward work that is truly winning souls, getting people saved? I have no room, he says. Um, verse 18. What does he say instead? What does this guy, what does this covetous man, that's what he is, what does this wicked, covetous man say in verse 18? And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there I will bestow all my fruits and my goods. This, I mean, is he looking out for the needs of others? Is he trying to finance the work of God? No, he's self centered. That's what a covetous person is selfish, self centered, right? You're not generous to other people, you're not hospitable to other people. Right? That's what he is. He says, hey, I've got so much, I want more. They're never satisfied. People that are covetous are never satisfied. They have more than they need and they still want more. They, he wants the bigger barns. He wants to fill them up even greater. And, you know, if he had the chance to fill it, no doubt he'll be like, man, I filled it up again. I need even bigger barns for myself. Verse 19. And I will say to my soul, look what he says to his soul, he speaks to himself, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years, take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. So he seeks an early retirement. He goes, man, I've built up so much, I'm doing really well. Does he thank the Lord? No, he says, soul, you're so good, right? You know, you've built this up. You know, for many years, you know, just praising himself rather than thanking the Lord for his provisions. He seeks an early retirement, seeks to have it easy, seeks to have pleasure and ease in his life. There's nothing really wrong with that. There's a time for resting. You know, and I, I understand that, you know, if, you have a, if you've been working, you know, what's the retirement age now? Is it still 65 or has it gone up? 67? I don't, I don't, 67 now, it's gone up a little bit. Uh, look, I mean, obviously... People retire because they're not as productive in the workforce as they could be, like as a, as a younger person might be at that age. I mean, that in of itself isn't necessarily wrong, right? But let me just say this. There is no retirement in the Lord's business. There's no retirement in the business of the Father, working for the Lord. Okay, I'm not talking about your, your, uh, you know, your, your job, you know, your, your, um, your, your career. I'm not talking about that, you know, what you need to provide for yourself. But there is no retirement in the Lord, in the Lord's business. There's no retirement there. And uh, yeah, look at verse 20. But God said unto him, so how does, the, how does God re respond to the covetous rich man? But God said unto him, thou fool. And that's what they are. These rich men that are self-centered, right? That are just trying to build their own kingdom, their own wealth, right? That they don't look out for the needs of others. They're no, not worried about the kingdom of God. God looks at them and says, Thou fool, this man is foolish. He thinks he's done it well. He thinks he's built up this, this, these barns of possessions. He thinks he's going to live a peaceable life now and that he's done it all himself. But God looks at him and says, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? God calls covetous people fools. And what does God say to him? You're going to die tonight. The time has come for you to die. You're not even going to enjoy your retirement that you had planned. You're not even going to enjoy the things that you built up in this life, the treasures on this earth. No. And then he says, Who shall those things be which thou hast provided? You cannot take your wealth with you into eternity, into the afterlife. 
into the eternal future that God has. You cannot take your wealth with you. Think about that for a minute because this life is a vapor. This life is 70, 80, 90 years, if you're lucky, 100. And everything that you build up here is only for that period of time. You've got eternity and you won't be able to take your possessions with you. You know, you can work so hard, build up a kingdom here, and it's all finished when you die. You can't take it with you. So what do you want to invest in? Do you want to invest in the now or do you want to invest in the future? Do you, do you want to invest in the temporal or do you want to invest in the eternal? The covetous person invests in the temporal. The covetous person invests in the earthly. Okay? Verse 21, Luke 12, 21. So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Now, was this a rich man? Well, yes, Jesus said he was a rich man at the beginning, right? A rich man, lots of wealth, but he was not rich toward God. Okay, not rich toward God. So does God want us to be rich? Yes, super rich. But where? In heaven, toward God, toward heavenly, eternal things. That ought to be where your investment is, okay? You can live a poor life here and yet have great riches and be someone mighty in heaven, okay? Yet we have the rich today and often when they become rich, they become self-centered, they become covetous, they become selfish and if they're saved, they won't have their treasures in heaven. They won't have much in heaven. You know, they get to enjoy what their life, like I said, 70, 80, 90 years, but for all eternity, they're going to miss out on the person who has invested in the future. So there's nothing wrong with being rich. There's nothing wrong with having treasures as long as it, uh, they are toward God and not laying up treasures for yourself like the covetous does. The covetous person is not rich toward God and is not laying up treasures in heaven. Look at verse number 22. And he said unto his disciples, Therefore, so because of this, because of the parable we just learnt, therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat, neither for the body what ye shall put on. The life is more than meat, and the body is more than raiment. So these are things that we often think about. You wake up, put your clothes on, your raiment, that's what raiment means, your clothing, and you're hungry, you have your breakfast, your meat. Those are the first things that generally come to your mind you know, in, in, in your new day. Jesus says, don't give thought of those things. Wow. How do we reconcile that with going to work? You know, because the Lord tells us that we ought to work and provide for our, for our family, or we're worse than an infidel, right? If we don't provide for our own, we're worse than an infidel. How do we reconcile that with say, saying, take no thought for, you know, our food and our raiment? You know, don't, 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 you know is, that a, is that a contradiction? Well, no, because we know that the commandment... Look, here's the thing. If we have a commandment of God in the Bible... You don't even have to think about it. You just do it, right? Do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together. Oh, let me think about it. No, you do it, <laughs> right? Um, you know, thou shalt not bear false witness. So let me think about it. No, you tell the truth. You don't have to think about the things that God commands of us. God commands fathers and husbands to go and work and provide for their family, make sure there's financial stability in the home so they can provide. That is God's plan. That is how God makes us not think about these things. Because if you're doing what, you're, what, you're, what the Lord asks you to do, you won't be thinking about food or raiment because you'll be providing for your family. Those two things go together. You don't take thought of the things that God commands us to do. Okay? Don't take thought or don't worry about these things, obviously, if we're doing the things that God wants us to do. Look at verse 24. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, which neither have storehouse nor barn, but God feedeth them. How much more are ye better than fowls? So the Lord knows what we need. He looks after the birds. How much more important are we than birds, the Lord says. And which of you we've taken can, thought can add a stature one cubit. Oh, I wish I could add it. I don't know how, how much a cubit is. I kind of wish I could add a cubit to my height. I'm a bit short. Right? But I can't. There's nothing I can do about it, right? He says, which of you taking thought? That's the same thing. Is, is there, can you think? You know, you've got reality. You know, face reality. There's nothing you can do and dream about and think about if it's out of your control. There are certain things that's in the control of the Lord. Verse 26. Uh, if ye then be not able to do that thing which is least... Why take ye thought for the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They toil not, they spin not. And yet I say unto you that Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. 
If then God so clothed the grass, which is today in the field and tomorrow is cast into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O ye of little faith? So God provides our clothing there in verse 28, verse 29, and seek not ye what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, neither be ye doubtful mind, neither be ye of doubtful mind. So God provides our clothing and God provides what we eat. God provides for our food. Verse 30. For all these things do the nations of the world seek after, and your Father knoweth that ye have need of these things. So the Lord knows we need our clothes. The Lord knows we need to eat. Now let me ask you something. Do you have clothing? I want to, I want to see if you can put your hand up. Do you have clothing? Uh, yeah, I mean, if you didn't have clothing, you wouldn't be here. Right? <laughs> Did you, did you eat something today? Put your, keep your hand up if you've eaten something today. All right. Now, do you notice that that's all that's mentioned in this, in this uh, passage here? Your clothing and what you have to eat? That's what the Lord wants us to rejoice in. If you've got clothing and you've got food, you're a blessed person. The Lord God has looked after you. But you're going, oh, hold on, what about my house? What about my possessions? What about my car? No. You ought to, look, if you cannot find joy in just being clothed and just having food on the table every day of your life, then there's something wrong with you, okay? You want to find real joy in your life? You want to find real satisfaction in your life? Then rejoice in the bare minimum that the Lord has provided for you. I'll tell you why. Because when you look and you say, well, not only do I have clothing and, and food, but I've got a family, I've got a wife, I've got a kids you're going to rejoice in that even more. You're going to be even more thankful to the Lord for the extra things that the Lord has given you. God, the Lord's given me a house. The Lord's given me this church. The Lord's given me, you know, my, my workplace. Or all, the, all the stuff that you know you don't even need in your house. The Lord's given you all that because if you can find joy and contentment in the bare minimum, you're going to be able to rejoice and be thankful and be satisfied for all the other things that the Lord gives you. Okay? If you cannot find joy in the bare minimum, then you're never going to be satisfied. You're going to be or become or, or uh, be like a, that covetous, wicked person because you're not going to find contentment. And that is the main problem with covetousness is that you are lacking contentment. You are lacking satisfaction in the things that God has given you. Right? You look, I mean, God's given us so much. We live in such a blessed country. You know, and who, you can't be poor in this country. It's impossible. Right? The Lord's given us so much, but if you're covetous, you're always wanting more, you're always wanting the bigger house, the bigger car, you're wanting more possessions, you want you know, the latest computer and the latest PlayStation and all that kind of stuff, then you will be covetous and you will not be satisfied in life. And that's the biggest problem because it, it can destroy your life. It can destroy your outlook. It can destroy your attitude. That's the major problem with covetousness. And... Uh, if someone's covetous in this church... Now, look, I, I know we, we all kind of like, oh, man, you know, there's this, there's that that I kind of want in my life. Is that covetousness? Look, someone that is covetous, I'll tell you right now, all they're thinking about is money. You talk with them, they're talking about money. They're talking about the bigger house. They're talking about the bigger car. They're talking about, you know, this investment, that investment, and, you know, everything that you can think of. You know, asking you, how much did you spend on that? How much did you spend on this? You know, they want to know about your financial affairs. Constant, I'm not saying, look, there's a time to talk about those things, but that's what's on their mind. That's what's in their heart, okay? That selfish desire. And the problem with that in the church is it's appealing to the flesh, okay? We have the flesh, we have the spirit, and talking about possessions, talking about wealth is very appealing to the flesh, and it can be a very toxic environment around someone that's covetous. They can cause a, you know, you might be satisfied. You go, man, I'm so happy. My, you know, the little house that the Lord has provided for me. I'm so happy that we've got. And then someone comes along and says, man, you know, don't you wish, you know, you had this or you should have that. And all of a sudden, because you have the flesh, it's like, yeah, kind of, yeah, it'd be such a great thing to have this or to have that, you know. Um, and that's why it will hurt a church to have someone that's covetous because you're going to appeal to the flesh. And then you're going to start working toward the things of this earth. You're going to start working toward the things that are temporal and not working toward the kingdom of God to the kingdom of heaven. Look at verse 31, Luke 12, 31. But rather seek ye the kingdom of God and all these things shall be added unto you. The Lord says, look, just worry about my kingdom. 
worry about my commands. Do the things that I ask of you. Go soul winning. Go to church. Read your Bible. Speak to me. Bring your request before me. Do the things that are of the kingdom and I will make sure that you're provided for. You should never be in a state where you worry, Kevin, I'm worried about what I'm going to eat tomorrow. Look, if you're, doing the, if you're seeking first the kingdom of God, the Lord will provide for you. I prom- Look, that's the promise of God. I'm not going to make that promise to you. The, the Lord's promising that to you. You set His kingdom first. You do the things that the Lord wants in your life and you will always have the things that you need in your life. Guaranteed. That should give you great faith, great confidence in our Lord. Seek the kingdom of God. You either seek your own kingdom, your own possessions, or you seek the kingdom of God. There's no in between. And that's why the covetous person has to get kicked out of the church because it's going to cause everyone in the church to seek after their own kingdom, to seek after their own possessions rather than being rich toward God. Verse 32. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. The Lord wants you to be rich in Him. Sell that ye have and give alms. Is that the covetous man? Does the covetous man think about selling what he has and giving? No. That's how we ought to be. We ought to be people that are mindful of the necessities of others and give of what we have. Provide yourselves bags which wax not old, a treasure in the, in the heavens that faileth not, where no thief approacheth, neither moth corrupteth. You know, the more you have, the more wealth you have, the more you're afraid of losing it, the more you're afraid of the thief coming and taking it. He says, hey, put the treasures in heaven. There's no thieves there. No one's going to take what belongs to you. That's where you ought to be investing. It's a bag that doesn't wax old. You know, It won't, won't open up and you'll drop all your coins in heaven. No, your riches in heaven are secured forever. Okay? And then look at verse 34. And that's, this, is the, this is the heart of the issue here. Verse 34. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. That's probably another good title for the sermon. But let me ask you, where is your heart? Like, where is your heart tonight? You know, do you have a heart for the kingdom of God? Are you seeking, you know, heavenly wealth or are you seeking material wealth? Well, it's one or the other. It's not anywhere in between. What, where is your heart? Okay, where is your heart? You guys think about where that might be. But covetousness, guys, is a wicked sin. A wicked sin. Now turn with me to Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20, verse 17. Exodus chapter 20. Verse 17. So, covet, uh, coveting is one of the Ten Commandments. There's one of the Ten Commandments, which is, Thou shalt not covet. Exodus chapter 20, verse 17. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. So it's one of the Ten Commandments. Again, is it just this mild sin, just something in the mind? No, it's pretty major, especially for it to be added to the Ten Commandments. Because there are hundreds of commandments, and yet there are these Ten Commandments that the Lord really wants us to be focused upon. And covetousness is one of those things. Now, the first thing you'll notice there in the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. You know, are you someone that thinks, we need a bigger house? Now, like, look, that thought has crossed my mind. You know, we've got the tenth child on the way, and I'm thinking, we need a bigger house. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, are we doing okay, Christina? I think, I think we're doing okay, even in the little house that we're in at the moment. But, you know... A few generations ago, having 10 kids was absolutely average, just normal. <laughs> you know, a few generations ago, people had smaller houses on average. People had smaller paychecks on average. People had less possessions in, on average. People had more children on average. You know, and it just seems like, uh, you know, I kind of think about that and I think, man, these people must have been content with what they had. Covetousness must not have been such a... Ma- I mean, look, it always is. It was, it was a problem in Jesus' time. I understand that. But it seems like in today's age, the reason we only have one or two kids is because we think about how expensive it is. Right? And, and yet, somehow, previous generations were able to do it. You know? And, that, you know, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. I mean, do you look at someone else's house and say, man, that'd be so great. I wish I had that. 
Now, it, it's not, look, if, if the Lord knows, does the Lord, does the Lord know what we need? Yes, if we seek his kingdom first and the Lord knows we need the bigger house, guess what? The bigger house is going to come. That's what it means. If we seek his kingdom first and the Lord knows we need the bigger house because we have a bigger family or whatever, then it's going to come. That's the faith. That's the faith that you need to have on the Lord. And what you have today, even though it might be, well, it's a little, it's a little tight, it's a little, you know, well, that's, the Lord knows what you need. That's what the Lord's given you. Okay? And if you go, Lord, no, you don't know what I need. I need something more. That's covetousness, right? You are basically telling the Lord, you, you know more of what your necessities are versus what he knows those necessities are. And, you know, like we're living in Aura, you know, and uh, there's a display village, like all the display homes. And we had a look because we were thinking, you know, should we sell in Sydney and buy something up here? It's very easy to get covetous going through those display homes. Man, we went into some of the really big houses, and you know how it is. It's all premium upgrades. It's, it, we looked and go, man, that is so nice. We could really do with, look at these tiles. Look at the size of this garage. Look at all these extra rooms and what, oh, the pool, the swimming pool. And, you know, to be honest, it's like, oh, man, this is awesome. I, I can really see ourselves being super comfortable here. You know, it's easy to become covetous. It's easy to want the bigger house, especially when you have the larger family. But the Lord says, don't covet. Don't covet thy neighbor's house. Don't covet another house. The Lord's providing for you what you need. Look at number two. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. Now, I don't know if you know this. Let me, I'll just read to you. You stay there. Stay where you are. But Romans 7.7. 7. Let me read this to you. Romans 7.7. 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. So what is lust? Covetousness. Desiring things, uh, material possessions or material wealth, that is lusting after material possessions. It's the same thing. Coveting is lusting, Right? Now, when he mentions here your neighbor's wife, it's talking about lusting after women. Lusting over women that are not your wife. Okay? That is covetousness. And that will get you kicked out of the church. All right? If you're coveting another wife, another woman that's not your wife, that will get you kicked out of the church. And what am I thinking about? I'm thinking about pornography. All right? You may not necessarily go out there and, and you know, commit adultery. Uh, but you probably have committed adultery in your heart, maybe looking at things like pornography. Pornography will get you kicked out of church because that's covetousness. That's lusting over someone that's not, that does not belong to you. That's not your wife. I had a look at pornography a little bit as far as some statistics and some things that uh, has been sort of researched. But let me give you some problems with, with pornography, okay? Because it's talking about lusting over someone that is not your wife. Pornography. First of all, pornography is addictive. It's an addiction. People say it's as addictive as cocaine. Addictive as some of these illegal drugs that people take and destroy their minds. Because looking at pornography releases a chemical in your brain called, um, I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing this wrong, but dopamine, dop dopamine which gives you pleasure. It's a feel-good chemical in your mind. It's the kind of chemical that the Lord's put in your body on purpose to get you motivated to accomplish certain tasks, to accomplish certain goals. The reason why you probably desire to have bodily exercise sometimes is because dopamine has, has, has gotten you uh, worked up, has gotten you uh, motivated to go and do that, and then once you've met that level, it, it kind of switches off in your brain. And it's like, yeah, okay, I, I've, I've done what I need to do. It's kind of like when you're hungry. When you're hungry, and, you know, your body says, all right, you're hungry. It releases that dopamine into your mind so you can go and have something to eat. But once you eat and you reach a point where you're full, it switches off. Okay, once it reaches that reward, once you've gotten that reward, it switches off. That's how it's meant to work in our bodies. It gets us motivated. It gets us doing something. But then it switches off. Okay, it's enough. It satisfied us. We've done what we need to do. But drugs like, co like cocaine, like marijuana trick your brain into continuously releasing this dopamine. Continuously. Pornography does the same thing. It releases more than what's natural in your body. It gives you great, a great high. That's why people say, you know, these people are high 
you know, when they're taking drugs and things like that. It does the same thing if you're looking at pornography. And then uh, you can only find that satisfaction if you continue in that drug or you continue in the pornography. That's why it's highly addictive because you only find that satisfaction. It, the only way you can find that satisfaction is by doing it again and again over and over and you don't find the same level of satisfaction because the reserves of dopamine drop in your brain and so you need more of it to keep, keep it going in your mind. That's, that's what makes something highly addictive. Drugs, pornography is highly addictive. Don't get into it. Don't look at it. You know, I, I remember when I was in high school and you know, we, we caught a train from school home and one of my friends found a pornography magazine on the train seat. You know, he's like, oh, look at this. And look, I was, what, maybe 13 or something, and I found it disgusting, right? I, I just, I, I, that's, you know, it's like, oh, but, you know, no. I, I, honestly, I was so disgusted by it. You know, that's how you ought to look at, you know, because it, it's a whore, right? It, it, it dis, de degrades that woman. And I was saved. Thank God I was saved. The Holy Ghost probably was being grieved. Don't, don't look at that, right? Was warning me, don't look at that. But that will destroy your mind. And the friend that I'm thinking about is divorced now anyway. I mean, it wouldn't, wouldn't surprise me if he's divorced because of pornography. And I'm going to show you some stats on this later on. But number two, pornography hurts your marriage. I mean, if, if, if you're a man and you're looking at this and your wife finds out, do you think she's going to feel... Uh, valuable and worthy in your, in your eyes if you're looking at other people? Don't you think that, that will hurt your marriage and hurt that marital relationship that you ought to have, the intimacy that you ought to have? You know, it hurts your marriage because the level of dop dopamine that gets released in your brain when you're looking at pornography is higher than your na normal natural inclinations toward your wife. And so, you know, when you're having that marital relationship, it's not going to be as satisfying as that pornography was. It's going to hurt your marriage. Stay away from this. Stay away from it. Number three, it will make you lose respect for women. And I'm not just talking about the men. The research that I had a look at, it says that even women are spending a lot of time. It's increasing the amount of pornography that women are looking at. Okay? And so it make you lose respect for women or women that are looking at it will make you lose respect for a man. And like... It's so, it's, so dis it's so wicked and disgusting because, you know, you can go from looking at just a woman and then you can go look into, you know, past that. And then before you know it, you're looking at a woman and a man. I mean, that, that ought to disgust you, right? Un unless you're a reprobate, unless you're a homosexual and you like looking at men, you know, don't look at pornography. It will destroy your mind. Destroy your mind. Destroy your relationships make you lose respect for women because you think of the women as that object for physical satisfaction or whatever and then you look at every woman and you think of them the same way you know you ought to come to church and respect the women in this church they're your sister in the lord okay and the men that's your brother in the lord you ought to look at one another that's my sister that's my brother i love them because we're in the lord we're in christ okay we're family not that's a whore. It'll make you lose respect for women. And number four, porno pornography leads to divorce. Pornography leads to divorce. I've got, I had a look at this, um, there was a Senate hearing in the United States in November 2005. So, I mean, that was like, what, 12, 12 13, 13 years ago. So I'm assuming things have gotten worse since then. Uh, November 2005, United States Senate hearing on, uh, hearing on pornography's impact on marriage and the family. Now, let me show you this. Probably something you haven't thought about. But 56% of divorce cases, 56% of divorce cases, more than half, involved one party having an obsessive interest in pornographic websites. 56%, more than half of divorce is because some person was looking at pornographic websites, destroyed their marriage. You need to stay away from that. Does God like divorce? You need to stay away from that if you want a grounded and sound marriage. And then there are some other stats on this, and uh, I'll just share them with you because I thought they were interesting. 68% of the divorce cases, 68% of divorce cases involved one party meeting a new love interest over the internet. Over the internet. So, I mean, has internet use gone up since 2005? Absolutely. That's probably a high percentage now. More divorces over finding some, you know, someone... You know what? On my Facebook page, I make sure 
that whoever I've got on there is someone that I personally know. If there's a woman on my Facebook page, it's because I, some, I know them somehow, from work or from school or my you know, family and friends. I do not have women on my Facebook page that just found me on, online and added me. Okay? And, I, and I did have some people like that. I got rid of them. I got rid of them, okay? Because I'm not interested in finding new love on the internet. <laughs> I'm interested in keeping my marriage pure and strong. Let me give you another number, uh, statistic here. 47% of the divorce cases involved one party spending excessive time on the computer. Okay, so this isn't even about pornography. This is about one spouse spending excessive amount of time, more than necessary, on a computer. 47% of divorce cases. You know, computer addiction, being, being on the computer, not spending time together as husband and wife, is one major way to have a divorce. And I know this isn't about covetousness, you know, but still, I think these are interesting statistics. And then the other one is, 33% of divorce cases cited excessive time communicating in chat rooms. So people going on, on Facebook, right, or other chat rooms, uh, 33%. Um, but then it says here, a commonly sexualized forum. So certain chat rooms that are all about you know, sex and pornography or things like that. I mean, technology is great, but men and women, if we're spending too much time on Facebook, on the computer, and we're not spending time together, it's going to hurt your marriage, okay? Pornography leads to divorce. Now, what else do we see in Exodus chapter uh, 20, verse 17? Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, we saw that, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant. So I don't have too much to add on these things, but obviously uh, some people can hire servants and some people cannot. You know, so you ought to not cover over the, the, the um, what, how do I say this? The, the ability for someone to have people serve them, you know? Um, some people have more, some people have less. If you have less, don't cover people that have more. You know, what, then it says he covered in uh, the ox, right? Uh... Sorry, Exodus 20, 17. Let me just read that again. Uh, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox. What's an ox? What was an ox used for? For working, right? For plowing the fields. It's kind of like your tools, your skills. It's your productivity, right? Maybe someone has a, a powerful ox, right? In those days, they could get a lot of, done, of plowing done, a lot of work done in the farm, and someone else didn't have that ability. Hey, don't cover that person's ox. It's kind of like maybe today, don't cover that person's skills uh, and position in the workforce. Do what you can in the workforce. And look, here's the thing. I, 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 the com one of the companies I worked for, I started as a forklift driver. You know, I, just op I wanted to get married. I opened up the newspaper, lots, saw lots of forklift driving um, work, got myself a forklift license, even though I had skills in IT, and I just worked in a warehouse. Worked as a warehouse, became a picker and a packer, driving forklifts, just, just on my foot all the time. Then there was a position uh, for data entry, basically. I said, I'll go for that in the office because I have asthma. The dust in the, in, the, in the warehouse was getting to me, so I went into the office, did a bit of data entry. Then a position went up for a data entry. A supervisor applied for that, got that job. And then there was a position for a, uh, in fact, I didn't have to apply for it. I was offered a position in a call center as a supervisor. I went to that and became a supervisor in the call center. And then, I was, uh, then I went, there was a position for an assistant manager. Um, and again, I didn't have to apply for that one. That was given to me. You know? And then it's like, okay, well, now we want you to be the manager in Australia and New Zealand. Okay, okay, I'll do that as well. Right? How? How did I start doing that? Did I, was I covered in someone else's position in the workforce? And here's the problem with a lot of people my age and younger. They think that they can get all these skills and all this education and they're going to get out of uni and earn the big bucks straight away. They don't want to get their hands dirty and start, you know, start small and work their way up. You know, that, that's the covetous person wants the big bucks now. They don't want to work hard. They don't want to strive hard and, and, and perform and let the Lord exalt them in the workplace, okay? You ought to be people that, yeah, someone else might have more, might be able to produce more, but I am going to do what I can. I'm going to work hard. And even if no one sees me working hard, I know the Lord sees me working hard and He's going to provide for my needs. He's going to give me the promotions that I, that I need for my family. He knows what I need. We read about that, but the covetous person, no, I want the big bucks now. And that's why they don't find work. Not because there's no work, they just don't want to work the, the, the warehouse job. Right? They don't want to work the garbage cleaner job. Right? And I'm just speaking to you young guys, hey, don't worry about getting your hands dirty. Work hard and the Lord will, will reward you. The Lord will take care of your needs. And then it says, nor his ass. So this is his donkey. 
Now, donkeys are more for transportation. You know, it's, it's, we're now at the point where it's more just um, somebody's... Um, uh, what's, what's the word that I'm thinking of? Somebody's luxuries. You know, non-necessities. Let's put it that way. Non-necessities. Not everybody had a donkey. And, you know, in the Bible, you're going to find this, this like, symbolism. Horses are often about war, warfare. And donkeys, because they're not powerful as horses, it's more like peace. And that's why when Jesus came riding on, on, on the donkey, on the ass into Jerusalem, you know, he wasn't coming in with his horse to take over Jerusalem. And he'll do that. He'll, t- he'll do that in the end times. He comes on his white horse, if you remember, coming and making war against the Antichrist and his, and, uh, his armies. But no, he came into Jerusalem on the donkey because he was going to offer himself up as the Lamb of God and bring peace to mankind through his shed blood. Uh, but these are luxuries. These are things that not everybody has. You might look at someone's luxuries. You might look at their car. You might look at their possessions that aren't necessities in life and covered over those things. If the Lord's not giving you those things... Don't cover it over them. They're non-necessities anyway. They're non-necessities anyway. If your car is banged up, you know, it's not necessarily roadworthy, but it gets you around, praise God. Praise God that you don't have the Ferrari or whatever it is, that you know, the Lamborghini. You know, if you've got a car that gets you from A to B, your donkey's pretty banged up. Hey, you got one at least. You got one at least. Praise God for what you have. Don't be covetous. And I'll just, I'll just read it again in conclusion. Luke 12, 15 and he said unto them, Take heed and beware of covetousness. Take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. Don't be like this. Don't be, if you're covetous, if, if you have that in you, then you need to overcome that. You need to overcome that now. And if you're someone that looks at pornography, that is covetousness. That is lusting after someone that's not yours. Okay, you need, to, you need to deal with that pretty quickly because it's addiction and it's, it's going to be hard for you to overcome, but you can overcome it you know, in the power of God. Get past these sins, guys, because I do not want to. You know, I do not want to kick someone out because of covetousness, but that's just the way it is. Let's pray.